Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Victoria City Council meeting of Thursday, September 8th, 2011. <coughs> Tonight, before we begin, uh, it's my great pleasure to invite Paul Laurie to come up and introduce uh, some readings tonight. My list says I have three people. So, not to say the Thunder is Rogers, if you would do us the I've been in London. I've been in France. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I waved to you from Bloomsbury. <laughs> and, uh, if you notice that your jelly bean level is a bit low, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm responsible. <laughs> but there are some small uh, they were for anyone who deserves them. Uh, we have three readers tonight, and um, we'll be brief because we know we have a big agenda. The first reader is one of the winners of the Emily Carr Postcard Contest at the Royal BC Museum. And our, the judges' decisions were quick and unanimous because we were delighted with the entries. And the first person is Ava Fournier, who goes to Margaret Jenkins School, and she's in grade one. Oh, awesome. Welcome, Ava.
It will be happening here at the Well in the evening, starting at 7 p.m. And I have asked uh, Victorians to commit acts of Borella poetry, to uh, put poetry in people's shoes, to ice cakes with lines of poetry, to uh, write poetry on um, cement, to uh, just present any way they can the ideas that they have for change. And uh, hopefully we can make a better world that day. Uh, so now, Barbara Pellman, who is um, known to all of you already, did two poems for National Poetry Month, one at Island Blueprint and one at uh, Café Salon. And Which one are you reading? The Blueprint. Oh, yeah. The Island Blueprint. A wonderful poem. And it's going to be in the anthology uh, Framing the Garden, which is an anthology of Victorian poetry and visual art. Barbara. Hi everyone. Um, I've had my surgery, so we can survive all of that. But uh, be careful of your kneecaps. When they say kneecap you, they really seriously mean it. Um, so this poem um, came from this wonderful idea, I think, to connect poetry and business, which is an old uh, Wall Art. It's an old Wall Street idea. Um, and uh, so I wrote this for Island Blue. I hung around there for a day or two and enjoyed everything. So, hanging around Island Blue. The poet wanted to be an artist, wanted to trade her words for paintbrush and pastels, graphite pencils and acrylics, to paint the world cerulean blue and Russian green, viridian and raw umber. Just name a color and she imagined a palette the size of her backyard, a river of kingfisher blue, a sky of Dresden yellow, champagne and buttercup. Amethyst and amber in the garden behind the house she painted moonstone and beast. She would cobble together collages made from ragged edges of bond paper, magazines and photographs from National Geographic, gift wrap charting the streets of Paris, the London underground. In her sketchbooks, Charcoal at hand, India ink, and pastels in long sticks and round cakes. She would rewrite her life without language, that cunning master who cajoles with vowels and music. She'd draw a road map to the caves where her secrets lie broken, form an alphabet with color and line and texture. She would remake the world. Thank you. For you as well. Thank you, Barbara. I truly appreciate that. Thanks, Barbara. And also, in uh, leaving, I left a brochure from the Altar and the Gallery on your desk. I was absolutely <coughs> delighted to go in there during Randy Cook's show and find that um, without my knowing, they had taken a poem that I wrote about one of Randy's paintings and put it on the wall. And that's exactly what we've been trying to do with, with this business initiative. And they did it on their own. So I'm really hoping that an idea that will keep on rolling in Victoria and will be known as the Business Poetry Coalition Capital. Thank you. Thank you so much. What I truly love about this, I just have this huge collection that I take home from my children <laughs> to enjoy. Thank you. With that, I would formally call the uh, City Victoria Council meeting to uh, I'd call, I'd call the meeting. Um, however, before we commence, I'd like to advise those in attendance of Council's expectation about personal conduct at this meeting. The City of Victoria is a respectful workplace, which means that each person is expected to treat others in a respectful and courteous manner. Council asks that each person in the audience refrain from interjecting while others speak or applauding following any person's remarks. For those of you who wish to address Council, we ask that you address your remarks directly to the Chair and Council and not to any person in the audience. Speak to the matter before council and respect the remarks made by others. As you approach, we appreciate your name and your address. Council has adopted the following public hearing policy. An applicant is permitted a maximum of 30 minutes at the start of the hearing to outline the proposal. Each member of the public is permitted a maximum of 10 minutes to speak during the hearing. When the permitted time for speaking expires, the person speaking must yield to the next speaker by taking their seats in the gallery. And uh, you also only get to speak once. Public hearing. 
Thank you. Mr. Whitlam, any additions, deletions, or amendments to the agenda? Yes, Your Worship. On page two, under item two, resolving application for 1568 West Hall Avenue, additional correspondence received. On page four of the agenda package, item H, additional correspondence received regarding the garden suites policy. On the same page, under item I, we have two additional requests to address council. On the following page, we have reports from community development, governance and priorities, and planning and land use standing committees, as well an additional motion for public hearing on September 22nd, and two additional items of closed business at the end of the meeting. Those are the additions to tonight's agenda. Thank you so very much, Council. My pleasure, please. All in favor, opposed, carried. Thank you. Next, Your Worship, we have the Council meeting minutes on August 25th. Move minutes. All in favor, opposed, carried. Thank you. Next, we have one proclamation. Uh, it's pro bono, but we're going to stay. All those in favor, opposed, carried. I know we almost blew that without Council Coleman being here. We can. Yeah, you go know one. Next, Your Worship, we have a public hearing. This is a public hearing for rezoning and development permit applications at property known as 976 Topaz Avenue. Under consideration this evening, zoning regulation bylaw, amendment bylaw 922, purpose of which is to amend the zoning regulation bylaw to rezone the land in this address to the R1S2 zone restricted small lot two story district to permit subdivision and construction of two new small lot single family dwellings. Development permit application is concurrent with this application to apply design guidelines to the site and reduce the minimum distance required between a lot's boundary and its buildings. Thank you. And for those who are new to the audience, um, the small joke that council made is every single uh, motion on um, proclamations in my eight years on this council has always been uh, uh, moved by Councillor Coleman. So I think this is the first opportunity that we've actually had something like that. So that's why we're joking that we didn't know what to do. And Councillor Coleman isn't here. Councillor Coleman is a, a pilot uh, representing the city of Victoria um, and for, as they are rep for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And I believe Councillor Lucas is in Vancouver. Um, addressing legalization of marijuana. Uh, own, uh, initiative. Um, thank you. Is the applicant here for the rezoning known as 976 Topaz Avenue? Yes. And do you have any responsibility for that high pitched whistle? Oh, never mind. We know what it is. Thank you. Uh, if you hold for a second, I'm uh, just going to help Ms. Gibbons uh, deal with the uh, hearing aid. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please proceed. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Evan Wong, and I'm the applicant for this rezoning application, representing my parents who are the owners of the property. Evan, could you pull the microphone just a little bit up a little? Or... Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, sir. This property is located between Quadra and Glasgow in an area of transition. There are apartments and condos directly across the street, and this property is only one of three houses on the street. Our property is in the middle, and there are two corner lots on either side. It should be noted that these properties, 2906 Quadra and 970 Topaz, are both at various stages of rezoning to create an additional small lot. Since January 2010, almost two years, we've been working with our designer, Victoria Design, immediate neighbors, Doug Rhodes and the Hillside Quadra Neighborhood Action Group, and the city. Based on feedback from each respective group, we have incorporated a number of design changes and we have submitted several iterations of our plans to the city. Examples include changes in our driveway designs to accommodate parking for two vehicles and reduce on-street parking. We have considered overall massing and proportion and ensured window locations maintain privacy. We have worked with the planning department to reduce garage prominence, creating borders and porch features for the front entry. At the Planning and Land Use Standing Committee meeting, we had a total of five variances. Today, those have been reduced to a total of two. Each proposed home will be two levels, with dining and living areas on the main, and four bedrooms on the upper floor. Additionally, there is also a garden shed in the rear yard that could provide storage for bicycles and building tools. As I mentioned, we are requesting one variance for each home. 
that the static area itself that would be reduced from 2.4 meters to 1.5. And this is for a habitable room with a window. To ensure privacy, the window will be frosted and fixed and it won't be able to be opened. This window is for the dining room and will provide natural light while maintaining privacy between both parties. properties. In terms of petitions, we received a total of 23 responses with three opposed for a total of 87% support. For our petitions, all adjacent homes to the property were pulled, and for the condos and apartments across the street, 71 letters were mailed out. For the opposed, one raised the issue of increased congestion, which we have mitigated by creating uh, parking for two vehicles in each driveway. This in addition to a one-car garage. Another respondent who was opposed thought that the lot would not be large enough for two homes, but thought a duplex may work. And for the third petition, no comments were provided, and this petition was sent directly to the city. Throughout the rezoning process, we've been proactive and transparent with the neighborhood, and we've received a lot of positive feedback from the community. This location in the city would be desirable to many families, given its close proximity to downtown, Topaz Park around the corner, Quadrant Elementary School up the street, and the many shopping and restaurant options available in Quadrant Village. Thank you for your time. Should the mayor or council have any further questions, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you. Council, do you have any questions of the applicant at this time? Councilor Hunter. Yes, I know that. So after that meeting, I submitted um, uh, a revised landscape plan, which identified uh, the border with our property and 970 Topaz to retain um, trees along that, that side, and we identified which ones will be retained. Thank you, staff. Can you confirm that it's to your satisfaction, the director of planning? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Seeing no further questions at council at the, from council at this time, I would open the public hearing. Are there any members of the public that wish to address the item known as 976 Topaz Avenue? Uh, please come forward, put your name and address. For the second time, are there any members? Please come forward, sir. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Vince Mellick. I own the house, my wife and I own the house 2906 Quadra. Uh, we think the small lot size is, is a great thing for uh, um, making uh, housing more affordable for our expressive city, uh, we back Mr. Wong's uh, application. Thank you, that's sir. I didn't quite catch the last name, so pardon me if I call you Vince. Vin Vince Keller. Keller? Keller, C U L L E N. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there any other members of the public at this time that wish to speak to the item known as 976 Topaz Avenue? Second time. Third and final time. Seeing no further speakers, I would call the hearing closed. Your Worship, we have consideration of third reading of zoning regulation bylaw number 922. Council, your wish. Second. Move to the second. Any comments at this time, Council? Seeing no comments, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the All those opposed? Any opposed? Carried. And that bylaw for adoption? So moved. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And we need a resolution to authorize the development permit. Motion to hold the conference. Seconded comments. See none. All those in favor? All those carried. Thank Thanks, you. Your Worship. This is a public hearing. This is a rezoning application and development permit application for property at 1568 West Hall Avenue. Under consideration tonight, zoning regulation bylaw number 920, the purpose of which is to amend the zoning regulation bylaw to rezone this address to the two-family dwelling district to permit the land to be used for a duplex. Also under consideration is the development permit that imposes uh, design guidelines in accordance with the intensive residential development. Thank you, and uh, Ms. Dave, can you confirm that the uh, statutory runaway has been um, registered and your findings to be already been done? Yes, it has been. Thank you, and you're looking lovely today, Ms. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. King. Um, is the applicant here? Would they wish to address the council? Good 
Good evening, Ron McNeil, McNeil Designs. So I'll be uh, briefly explained. And uh, Mr. Chang, the applicant, is here in case you have questions of him as well. Uh, what we're proposing is a side by side duplex uh, facing the West Hall and uh, with an accessory garage providing parking coming off of the uh, lane that runs, uh, runs behind the property. Um, we've uh, dealt with Oakland's Community Association. Uh, we've met with them a couple of times as the uh, plan developed and uh, conscious of things such as the uh, privacy to side yards. Uh, we're pretty much oriented most of our windows to the front and rear. And um, the only uh, real concern neighbors had primarily was, of course, as you always hear about parking and, and uh, traffic, um, the neighbors, of course, uh, the crossing beside us on West Hall wanted for sure us to use the lane. Um, as you've got in your correspondence, one lady was a little concerned uh, about us using the lane. Uh, not that many on this particular stretch use the lane yet, anyways. Um, and she had a particular little piece in her yard that kind of was towards the back of her fence that she was concerned about car fumes and things like that. And we said, well, as long as the car can get in and park in the garage, you're not going to really have any more of that than anybody else cluttering up and down the lane. Um, because of the concerns for parking from some of the neighbors, we initially uh, provided a larger paved area, and uh, that has subsequently been reduced, if you see in the correspondence between planning and us. Uh, we landscaped more of the rear yard, and essentially there's just enough pavement for the cars to access back out, turn around and go back out on the lane. And as you heard, there's a covenant to uh, allow widening of the lane. I guess it will slowly take a little strip from everybody along there. So we've had to set the garage back a little further in order to retain the setbacks from the prospective uh, covenant. So we've got, as you see in your package, uh, landscape plan and finishes, and there's even some photographs uh, showing the context of the neighborhood. Uh, we've uh, got the uh, front yard is fairly intensively landscaped, as well as the backyard as we're screening the existing buildings. So we're. Uh, Try and sort of do our part front and back. Uh, it's pretty much established uh, landscaping down the middle and fence lines, so there's not a lot of change between the properties. And on our facing us from West Hall on the right hand side, we're actually abutted by backyards, so the neighbors are quite a distance away from us. Which, uh, we haven't uh, had them come to any of the meetings or uh, contact us from uh, neighborhood campuses. We can trust that they're happy. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Neil. Uh, Council, any questions for the applicant? Seeing none, thank you both for coming forward to the public hearing. Okay. I would now open the public hearing for the item known as, um, I just lost the address on this, 1568 West Hall Avenue. Terrible thing to be done the wrong house. Um, <clears throat> is there any member of the public that would wish to speak? Consideration of third reading, zoning regulation bylaw, amendment bylaw number 920. Thank you. Any uh, discussion, Council? Seeing none, I'll call a question. All those in favor? I'm sorry to be distracted by that high pitch whistle. Yeah, I know, I don't know.
this is a, a DP development permit, varies in effect from a previous development permit, which uh, I think was approved probably six months ago. The material change is minimal, except at the rear. The intent is to link the ground floor <coughs> to the second floor with a stair and to have a live work arrangement instead of office separate departments over. So the, the development permit is for that, really for that connection and to permit the use of live work. Um, it's an infill site, you probably know it. I'm writing some I have a brief presentation if you want to see it, but you're probably familiar with the site. Um, are there any general questions? Council, are there any uh, good questions for them at this time or any desire to see the pictures? Everyone seems to be comfortable. Thank you. My name is Mary Miller, legally. My stage name is Romany Miller. Um, I live at 1315 Waddington Alley. I enjoy it. It's right downtown. It is a fabulous place to be. But when I bought that place, the architect who I was directed to by Mr. Lefebvre was very, very helpful. And the plans were reviewed, and the architect, I think, used to hunt. Yes? Is that right? Oh, please address us, sir. Uh, Sorry. Um, was, was really very, very helpful to me. But all of a sudden, um, his services were no longer available to me. I was quite prepared to pay the $100 an hour or whatever it was, and it vanished. Now, this place that I'm um, going to be opposite mine, which I think is absolutely fabulous, but, and I have no objection to it, but will the developer do what the architect wants instead of sort of changing it midway? I think that's probably all I have to say. But um, I don't feel very confident in Mr. Lefebvre. I do in the architect, but I think something happens on the route. So thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm sorry I don't have a proper presentation. But those are my issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and uh, we appreciate you bringing this to our attention. Are there any other members of the public at this time that wish to speak to the matter of Wellington Alley? Betty, please come forward, Ms. Higgins. Yes, please, Betty. While she's coming, I will say that um, when council approves something, if they do not build what has been approved, then they have to come back uh, and reapply, which is happening now. Um, and there's always a, a permit inspection at the end, an occupancy permit. That ensures that they build what was approved. So, I'm there so are some sorry, I didn't hear what you said, but I hope that you'll stop me if I do the wrong thing. Um, these are not fair. Your Worship, could we confirm that Ms. Gibbons is speaking to Waddington Alley? Ms. Gibbons, are you speaking to Waddington Alley? Designation. 
on the property at 611 Vancouver Street through heritage designation bylaw number 1146. Council, do you wish a uh, presentation by the applicant? Even if the applicant was here? Okay. With that, are there any members of the public that would wish to speak to the item known as uh, 611 Vancouver Street, the heritage designation? Yes, thank you. Welcome. My name is Michael Williams. I'm the owner of the building, Thomas Korean. And uh, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm designating this house in order to uh, add to the heritage cluster in that neighborhood running up Vancouver Street and coming on the corner to Fairfield Road and uh, continuing into my block on Collinson Street. Um, the house has been there for 128 years. It needs a little loving care, which we would like to do to it. And uh, we'd like to ensure that perhaps stays here. Thank you so very much. Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak to this item? For the second time, for the third time, any members on 611 Vancouver Street? Seeing none, I'll close the hearing. Your Worship, we have consideration of third reading of Heritage Designation Bylaw number 1146. Thank you. Comments? Councilor Thornton Joe. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and I'm uh, very excited to see this. Uh, uh, request for a heritage designation for this uh, address. Um, I enjoyed reading the background on it, uh, and I was actually familiar with the house uh, because uh, I volunteer and look after the cemetery at Harmon Point. And of course, I'm familiar that uh, Chu died and his, and his wife is buried at Harmon Point. And it was interesting, he was well known in the Chinese community. He was actually known to be quite eccentric. Uh, and he used to wear a, a, a scarf with Chinese writing, and on the writing it said, it would say in Chinese, uh, if, if, if China is not defeated, uh, if Chu Dai, and I got to look at my notes again, I'm getting it written up, it said in Chinese, if China does not get conquered, it will always be weak. If Chu Dai doesn't die, he will always be poor. And he would walk around Chinatown with these Chinese words on it. And what was interesting is at the Chinese cemetery, the only non-Chinese person buried there that we know of is Louise Schmidt, which is Chu Dai's uh, uh, wife. Um, and a few years ago, Paul Reed's um, son contacted me and he came from Australia to see where his grandfather and grandmother were buried and wanted to see where the house was located. So I was the one outside your house taking pictures. <laughs> so, okay, so I just wanted to share that Chinese history. Thank you. So you can now report to the police who that person was. <laughs> Not a stalker, as your counselor. Um, <laughs> counselor Madoff. Oh, you didn't know that you made one comment. <laughs> With that, I would call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And that went off for adoption. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next, your worship, a heritage alteration permit public hearing for the same property at 611 Vancouver Street. The permit will vary the front, rear, and side yard setbacks and the site coverage of the building. Thank you. Um, Council, would you like to hear anything from the applicant? No, thank you. Any members of the public wish to address this issue? Uh, second time, third time. Thank you, Mr. Wood. We need a resolution to authorize the heritage alteration permit. All in favor? Thanks, Your Worship. We have a non-statutory public hearing. This is in regards to the City of Victoria's Garden Suite policy. And I believe there might be a brief introduction by the plans now. Thank you, Mr. King. Yes, so this, this is the revised policy that was recently revised based on public feedback. Um, the revisions weren't substantive in nature, but helped to clarify some of the points where we noticed there was some uh, confusion arising. Um, we did document um, to, to council and committee in detail what those revisions were, um, as well as some, some of the additional comments that we received from the community, as well as from the Public Advisory Planning Committee. Um, uh, and uh, as you know, committee had uh, passed a motion to advance this for consideration on staff hearing to be made an official policy, uh, providing clarity to the community that uh, this is the, the policy which should be used. Uh, when 
considering a rezoning application for a garden seed. Thank you. Council, are there any questions for staff at this time? Uh, I recognize that there was some feedback in some for some amendments, suggestions. Councilor Vanoff and then Councilor Young. Thank you, and I know that staff has reviewed all the correspondence that we've received as well, and I, I had made a, made a list of some of the, the specific questions that have been referred to us by um, members of the public. One, um, I think I've got about five, and I'll just go through as quickly as I can. One was uh, a requirement for a referral to the advisory design panel. I'm wondering if that was considered or whether it was simply left that that would be at the discretion of the council of the day or whether it was considered as a requirement. Uh, it's, it's not considered to be a requirement uh, for the garden suite. Typically, smaller scale projects tend not to go to budget design panel. There are some limitations um, in terms of um, uh, professional accreditation for the architects on the panel to only hear presentation from other registered architects in this type of building actually be done by a building designer. Um, so uh, those, are, those are technical issues that can be addressed. Should, should one um, be advanced to ADP, but it's not typical to advance projects of this scale um, to the advisory design panel. Instead, staff would provide an analysis of the consistency between the proposal and the guidelines to report to council. And then at that point, the council would chose to, to send it to ADP. I think it might be something I'd be interested in hearing what my colleagues have to say, because although they are small buildings, their impact can be quite significant. And so whether or not the design panel would be useful. My understanding is that um, with design panel, there are buildings that do not require an architect, and so I don't believe they would be put in a position of conflict in terms of their professional um, ethics versus times when a building has come in that should have an architect that doesn't. So I think we can clarify that, but I think it's that issue of sensitivity and how much oversight would be given. So I'd be interested in hearing as we continue our discussion about whether a recommendation or a requirement for a referral to a design panel might be useful in the body of the, uh, the document. Uh, one of the other questions or comments that came to us, and again, I just be appreciative of staff's comments, is the use throughout the document of the word should uh, versus the word must. And, and that's a, quite a fair observation. It does make a difference in guidelines, whether it says should or shall or must. Um, the, the consideration we went through the development of this policy is that uh, this is a policy that is to be applied to 7,500 or so properties in the city. There will be a number of different issues that arise, uh, different significance and prominence on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and there's also a number of um, I guess you, you could say, when overlaying the, the variety of considerations for each application, um, it may not be possible to meet every single guideline. Um, for this reason, we've also included uh, a hierarchy of considerations so that it's helpful to understand uh, that protection of mature trees is of, is of high importance um, on adjacent properties and secondary protection of mature trees on existing properties. So, um, it's simply a, a recognition that given the constraints for each, each property, it's quite likely that in any situation, it would be a challenge to meet 100% of the guidelines. So this should then allows us to consider the policy as a whole um, and, and, and not necessarily be um, stopped if there's one aspect of the policy that's, that um, is preventing the application from um, being successful when it meets all other aspects and might actually contradict the other piece. And you touched upon one of the other issues that was brought to our attention, and I think the wording when it comes to trees on the site, on the, on the proposed development site, I think the word is used is respect. And it, it seemed to uh, me in reading the correspondence that it's quite similar to the consensus our tree bylaw where the trees are protected unless they're in the way of the building or the driveway. And this seems to be following along in that way as well. So I think we, if I'm reading it correctly, we need to be aware that um, there's actually more attention perhaps paid to the trees on adjacent properties than on an existing property, and that it could result in, uh, is that correct, in the removal of a significant tree? Uh, 
uh, there, there is potential for that during construction, uh, thinking of foundations and, and, and uh, impacts on root systems. Um, this again is why we have the uh, sort of the shed system, because then it may be um, desirable to relocate the garden suite to a different location in the rear yard. Mm -hmm. Maybe the trade off is that there's additional shading. Of course, we're trying to minimize shading on adjacent properties as well, and it allows us to make those sort of um, uh, those trade offs between the two. And that's very helpful. I don't think that was necessarily clearly understood by some of our correspondents in terms of how it would be looked at in its totality with each of those uh, principles identified and how best to respond to it. Um, just two last things. One was the, the, the distance from the lot line. Two feet to uh, some folks seems very modest in terms of impact on an adjacent property. Uh, yes, and, and it may in fact through the design review process be determined that the best location, either because of privacy or height or shadow, would be further away. Um, the, 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 that requirement came from um, some desire to have consistency between this policy and the existing accessory building requirements. Um, as you may know, the accessory building requirements for a non-residential building um, uh, had similar setbacks and recently changed from having no setback. Um, there is, there is a, also a, um, a relationship between the distance to the lot line and the amount of um, windows and openings and fire ratings. So that, that's going to come into play as well. So it, it might actually be the case that uh, many of the successful applications aren't 0.6 meters from the lot line. They're further. Um, but that is a starting point that we've used given that it's the same as any other accessory. Accessory building, that's, that's what my understanding was. And the, the last issue is on um, page 198, and it's under the heritage section. And it requests that all properties identified on the heritage register would receive heritage designation when a garden suite is introduced to a property. And I, I think that's a, a very useful mechanism. But be mindful that our heritage registry has enormous gaps in it in terms of the amount of resources been able to be directed at it or to it in all of our neighborhoods. And what I was wondering whether there might be an opportunity for any language that would, would not be a requirement, but that would invite uh, that, that consideration for a property that might have heritage value. And that would clearly have to come from the owner um, because it couldn't be flagged and it's not on the heritage registry. But it just seems that it would be a, a very a very good way of increasing the designations also, just having that kind of overview, and I'm, again, I'll be looking to my colleagues around the table, but um, through you, Your Worship, to staff, had you given any thought to any language that would simply encourage that consideration? Your Worship, Mr. King and I are just discussing that it might well be possible to think, to make an amendment. Um, to um, suggest that consideration to the owner and not compel it. Yes. And, and so we can work on this burden. Oh, that's, that's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was my final question, Your Worship. I look forward to any further discussion on, on the points that these are the ones that I extrapolated from the correspondence we received. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll cover the table slightly. Uh, Councillor Thornton Joe, do you have any comments or questions at this time? Councillor Young. Yeah, I think the, the most important thing about the policy is not the details of what's in the policy, but um, uh, the council's attitude toward applications under it. Um, I, I support the policy in the sense that I think that the guidelines that are put forward are, are sensible and reasonable for situations where garden suite is, is a desirable addition to the neighborhood. Just as I support the regulations for small lot, uh, small lot subdivisions with their setbacks and so forth for cases where those small lot rezonings are appropriate for the neighborhood. But I think it's important to, um, to stress to those who have concerns uh, that uh, these are guidelines that the council will use in evaluating applications, but um, the council 
is not suggesting by the adoption of these guidelines um, that uh, situations that meet these guidelines will have um, will have small lot uh, these uh, garden suites approved. And certainly, I am um, entering into this very much in that uh, with that caveat um, that um, we don't know what public reaction will be to these um, in in general or in specific instances. And uh, I think we have to be prepared to um, uh, be guided, uh, particularly in the early years, by public reaction as we evaluate uh, proposals that come forward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hunter? Um, I'm not oh, yeah, hold on, guys. Folks, before we do uh, supportive or not supportive, let's recognize that these are questions uh, and stuff for the staff. We have yet to open the public hearing, so we may want to remain open-minded to what may come forward. Thank you. Councillor Hunter? Councillor Luton? Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Worship, through you. Um, uh, just in my reading of the guidelines and with respect to uh, a couple of the comments, uh, um, am I correct in uh, making the assumption that uh, in this policy that uh, the uh, addition of uh, uh, garden suites uh, on any given property uh, does not uh, entitle That's correct. It's both the total site coverage for the property, um, which is based on the existing zone, um, as well as the rear yard site coverage, which varies on a lot by lot basis because the rear yard is, uh, is well, the percentage is consistent, but the actual amount is different because rear yards vary depending on the existing rear yard site coverage. Thank you. Councillor Alter, any questions for staff? Uh, any comments uh, for council discussion? And a question for staff, not on the garden suite policy itself, but on the recommendation that includes a reporting back in 30 months. Just following up on some of my colleagues on your comments, uh, given the fact that this is so new, and then although it certainly has had so much work into it, that it seems to have tried to participate in the neutrality. Something like this is obviously going to unfold, and we're really watching to see how it works. It lists the people's responses in the community and the neighbors and whatnot. I'm wondering if it would be feasible to slightly shorter reporting back time so that we have the ability to nuance it or respond to whatever concerns arise when we actually see these types of things going in. So I'd be wondering if we can look at perhaps an 18 month report back just and see, see how it works at that point. The, the, the reason we could vary the length of time that we're reporting back on, the reason we suggested 30 months had to do with uh, uh, timeline related to receiving an application, reviewing an application, approving or declining an application, and then if it's approved, um, allowing some time for construction. Uh, we were hoping in the report back period to report back and, and, and maybe even have photos of you know, finished products. So uh, reduced report back period might uh, mean that we don't have that opportunity at that point. Um, so that's why we that's why we listed it as 30.
my thought being, is there a way to sort of have, um, I, I mean, council can always send anything to design panel. We don't need to, they must versus do we wish to do that. Uh, almost have like the first cut having planning or director of engineering say, this one needs design panels. Okay, can they, so it's almost a, a I don't know how I put it, but at the discretion of uh, the director of planning, uh, a direct referral to design panel. So it's cutting the baby in half. If it's simple, if it's easy, let's move it forward to council. But if it's one that uh, has impacts, uh, I'm not sure if staff want that responsibility. Um, I'm not sure if it's onerous to say everyone must do it. So like I say, maybe an extra couple of weeks to a, a process, but it's six to eight months anyway, so it's a week or two. Um, so uh, I guess staff's comment on on uh, a discretion of the director of planning versus uh, the requirement to go to the design panel. I don't know. There are times when you don't want to be wasting the design panel's time. Uh, well, so that's, that's the discussion we were just having around um, the, trade, the various trade-offs around um, the desire for the city to um, be, be open to these possibilities streamlined processes or the processes that are fairly straightforward. Um, in some cases, this may, um, uh, you identified the time implication. The converse we were dis discussing is if this became something that was happening more regularly, um, there is a consequence of design panels spending time on projects of this scale as volunteers. So it, it's a series of trade-offs and judgments. Um, on the question of making a discretionary choice, um, we presently do do that on a variety of things. So you know this one, we, do, we make some of those choices. Um, sometimes we don't send something to design panel and council has that choice also. So it, it's a series of trade-offs and judgments. And it's where on that series you want to make the Choice. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess I was thinking through the process because of these would require a rezoning. Uh, the first report would come to planning and land use committee. There would be three members of council uh, would have first cut, and, and they could say, you know what, it's our belief that this needs a design panel, set a design panel. Um, uh, maybe, perhaps, as part of the policy, is, is really when the report comes to um, planning and land use. There's actually a line there that says, you know, staff think they would benefit by referral to design panel. I mean, it should be in staff's line. Directly address it, never let it slip by, never let it. So it's one of those lines, just as we say, you know, what our climate guy think about this? It should also be, um, should this one receive referral to design panel or not? And that might um, set those that need the benefit of the design panel and those that don't. And really, ultimately, it's the discretion of council's uh, land use committee. Land use committee right now, the current members are Councillor um, Alto Hunter and uh, Madoff. Would that be an extra owner step or deal with some of the issues? I'm just be interested in hearing that, and then I'll address my second issue. I think sometimes it's useful just as a reminder. I don't think sometimes, you know, as we're working our way through applications, I don't know that we're always thinking about what the opportunities are for referrals. So a line that simply says this is an option could be useful rather than having it in training. Okay, so can you have, I mean, that means it's always a good one, actually, in any language conference, it should this, or should this not? We want to make sure staff turns their mind to it. Thank you. Okay, perhaps that's the assembly, yes, uh, Mr. City Manager. Uh, through your worship, we could do that administratively. We could make a note of making sure that we had uh, a comment about whether it, uh, in our in our mind, uh, would require uh, a review by. Yeah, I'll say that. A note on the base plate that everything that goes in that piece that'd be an easy way to do it. Thank you. Um, okay, so there's a suggestion in the anyway. The other one which I want to look at, let's raise it. Um, we have an incentive program for our secondary suites, and there was discussion about garden suite policies and whether it should apply to this. The discussion was well, there's a difference um, that secondary suites that we legalize them um, as, as a matter of course if it's within the zoning, and therefore. Well, we can incent them. There was a discussion about, but are we saying two things? You have to go to rezoning, you have to make this. So at one point we're, we're putting, for lack of a better term, I don't think it's true, but 
will go part the other way. You're putting roadblocks up on this hand, and on this hand you're saying, here's some money to do it. Are we sending double signals? Um, what someone said to me today on a totally unrelated matter, but it was like, they said, remember the little guy. And, and I think what stuck to my mind is, you know, as we look forward, we're going to start considering the STIR program, which is the short-term incentive for rentals. Those for big apartment buildings, we develop big, those sort of things, we, we want the rentals. But um, I think that most garden suites or secondary suites, most, uh, are either mom and pop owner has them, or someone, a small builder, uh, who's just been doing a very small thing. So in my way, it, it's sort of a, if we're going to provide incentive for rentals, um, we have to remember the little guy. The little guy may need his incentive is five thousand dollars, but that never takes away from the fact that, as Mr. Mr. King said, this is the policy. You have to go through zoning. It's all these hoops that you're actually not going to be able to apply for that until you actually have the legal authority to do it. And so, I didn't quite put those. Con I didn't, in my mind, I didn't see a conflict from those two requirements. That was it. If you essentially uh, get permission to have a legal garden suite, then that you can then apply. So I would actually like to see if we could apply the um, secondary incentive program to garden suites once they're legal. Council comments? Don't know. Council Rana? Well, again, I'm just feeling a little bit uncomfortable how we're discussing this when we haven't opened it to public. I thought we were simply asking very specific questions to staff. So I don't feel comfortable having that discussion until we've opened it to the public. Great. May or may not wish to speak, but I would like to speak on it at the appropriate time. Thank you. Then let's do that. Let's open it up to, to the public have any comments on our garden suite policy. They may add to the question that maybe we to discuss on. Okay. Thank you. With that, um, I would call the non-statutory public hearing open. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak to the um, garden suite draft, the draft garden suite policy um, that City Victoria is recommending and putting forward? For the second time, any members? third time. Okay, with that I'll call the hearing closed. And totally understandable, we've been chewing on these for three years, so I think there's been a whole lot of discussion on this and a lot of consultations. Thank you. Um, council, I would look to, first of, I believe, we were looking for staff to see if they could craft the change, and we believe that needs to be an amendment to allow the heritage uh, reference that Councillor Manon wanted to put in, so I think that would be part of it. I think that separate from this policy, should we separately, we can separately consider whether we want the secondary suite incentive program. It doesn't need to be tied to the consideration of this policy. So we just separate that out. We'll deal with that later. Um, okay, so Ms. City Manager and then Councilor Manor. I think uh, in terms of uh, the incentive program, uh, it would benefit from a review by finance folks, et cetera, I think, okay. to make a policy here without the advice of staff it would come in a later report. I'm comfortable with that. I know I want to move it. I'm not right, but we just get that later. Councillor Balto or Do you have the wording with them? If I, I'll read this out and see if um, an additional <coughs> statement at the end of the heritage section on page 198 of your agenda, along the lines of where a property may have heritage value but has not been identified or included on the heritage register. The city would encourage applicants to consider heritage designation as they pursue approval of a garden suite. Brilliant. I, that's what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I had it written down just like that. Perfect. Councillor Madoff, if you would, if you would move adoption of the garden suite policy with that amendment to put it on the table. I would. And if I can get a seconder, I'd like to speak to the point. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Let's begin. Councillor Madoff and then Councillor Alto. Thank you. I, I just wanted to, to speak in support of the, the, the query that Councillor Alto made in terms of the length of the reporting back. Um, so I'm wondering, rather than the 30 months that we could have, the suggested 18 months, and if we haven't had any applications come through and be finished, that staff would simply come back and say that that should be extended. But I really like the touching base to happen a little sooner. So again, that would be um, an amendment to my own motion, so I guess that's very friendly. Or Councilor Holto could make a friendly amendment to my, my motion just for that 18 months with the understanding that we haven't had completed projects that performance of that and suggested the more appropriate reporting back. Mr. Mayor, 
Ms. David. Your Worship, the other point Mr. King raised with me is that if council were presented with any concerns earlier, council could always raise them. You know, that you don't have to wait to raise the issues either. Council has not shown themselves hesitant in the past to raise them. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, um, for the discussion on the matter, Councillor Holto, did you want to add something? I was just actually going to propose an amendment to that, to Council Maddox's motion to change that to 18 months. I, I completely understand the issue of waiting for two and a half years, but I do agree with Council Maddox's comments that in 18 months we haven't had any bills. Well, it's easy to report on them. And then we can have a discussion about extending it by whatever seems appropriate at the time. But I'd, I'd really like to have in the recommendation sense that uh, we want to see as, as, as reasonably quickly as possible uh, what this looks like so we have an opportunity to tweak it if it looks like it's necessary. So I know that's a friendly amendment for setting something that's Vote uh, first on the amendment to the motion, to the amended motion. Uh, I need a seconder to amend it to 18 months, please. Seconder, please. Thank you. All those in favor of amending it to 18 months? Great, thank you. We now have the main motion, which is amended to 18 months, and including the heritage piece. For the discussion on the largest of stand-up pieces, I'm really happy with the secondary to uh, Garden State Policy where we're at right now. On behalf of Councillor Coleman, good work. Uh, you're, you're, you have to be happy, you don't get a choice. <laughs> Your Worship, we just want to be clear on the last part of the motion. We, we would be probably happier if you just said 18 months. Uh, and not sort of qualifier unless we build it just in because you might have been one or two. So yeah, come back after 18 months. Just 18 months. Yeah. So 18 instead of 30. So 18 instead of 30. Everybody clear that one? Great, okay. On behalf of Councillor Coleman, who's been rather excited about Garden Suites, um, thank you for your work, uh, Council. Uh, thank you for the work, staff especially. Mr. King, well done. Uh, Council, on that, no question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next, Your Worship, we have three requests to address Council. First request is from Deborah Knorr. Deborah, are you here? Deborah Knorr, are you here? Thank you. Uh, Deborah wished to bring us the attention that there will be a BC Thanksgiving Day food drive. Look forward to seeing that. I'll come forward. Uh, the next speaker then would be. Next speaker is Andrew Rushforth and Bridget Clark, Victoria Heritage Foundation. Andrew Rushforth and Bridget Clark, Victoria Heritage Foundation. Mr. Rushforth, Ms. Clark, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Andrew Rushforth, Chair of the Victoria Heritage Foundation. And with me is Bridget Clark, the Executive Director. We're here to present our 2010 annual report. Um, I wish to thank you for your support throughout the year and years. Um, 2010 was a relatively uh, less active year than, than, than usual. Um, 45 houses received grants. Um, and I think probably due to the problem with market forces about 18 months ago, uh, applications were being made for, for those grants. Um, on, the, on the PowerPoint, you can see examples of houses that did receive grants. These are all after photographs. And the one near the end on Grant Street will show before and after.
that's pretty much what we just did. Yeah. Um, we have to speak to Yeah, I just wanted to pause that one because that's a pretty amazing transformation of that third, well, the third picture in is the rebuttal to the 1970s house that I uh, really never thought was heritage. But um, six months later, it looks like that on the right, quite a transformation. Betty Gibbons, 933 Convent, please. A few months ago, I invited you to come with me in your imagination on an actual walk I took along with Songway. A beautiful tiny hummingbird flies from a bush in the land adjacent to the proposed marina site, which reportedly would comprise a restaurant, cafe, marine chandler, marine concierge, offices, and retail spaces. Presumably, a facility for customs checking procedures would also be included. A solution to adding more customs offices, presumably needed for the increasing number of vessel docking locations now on the 
Park would be to relocate all marine transportation facilities to one spot, not in point for example. I respectfully suggest that you should not grant any permits until you receive confirmation in writing that a proposed development has been approved by all the appropriate authorities, including the Ministry of Fisheries and Oceans. Fish food, food is becoming increasingly scarce and expensive. Consequently, it is critical that fish habitat not be destroyed in any way, both in order to benefit Victoria citizens personally and as a commercial resource for the economy as a whole. Has any thought been given to alternative methods to dispose of polluting sewage? dishwash your water from the restaurant customers, along with the abundant, undesirable, chemical-laden soaps, etc. Rather than dumping it in the harbour, removing elsewhere by barge could be considered. An architect's report mentions providing additional parking by painting lines on the west side. No way. This is or ought to be a pedestrian park. There must be no loophole that will enable such travesty to actually happen. The goal should be to reduce reliance on vehicles or suffer the harmful consequences of their spouting emissions adversely affecting people's good health. The waterfront pedestrian path is supposed to be, quote, continuous, but won't actually be an uninterrupted one because it would extend only around three sides of each of the two view blocking buildings, presumably none of the fourth sites being available for the public waterfront path. That will establish an undesirable pattern, one likely to be a factor when considering future developments. Furthermore, reports mention gates for the waterfront path. What would they have gates for? Are gates to be locked to keep people out? If so, at the times of day the path is available for public access, should be posted and the person responsible for locking and unlocking them listed. Compare those handicaps with the lower causeway. There are no gates there, and the width of the public path is sufficient for several pedestrians to walk comfortably in both directions. Other comparisons include Milestones Reservoir, also other eateries that are constructed well back unlike this marina on stilts. Why is council leasing a city-owned lot as part of this unsatisfactory development? And why has the public not been made aware of this? I was part of the community input. Uh, I was part of the community's input during the formation of the Song East development. Public input to that was substantial and open. Proposed rooftop, proposed rooftop appendages such as masts and cables, likely would extend above the rooftops of the two buildings at the marina, spoiling the walk experience by blocking sea views. The gale-like winds that often blow there apparently have not been taken into account. Fortunately, there is a city bylaw that, that regulates erecting flags and bundling, a practice that is not permitted. I noticed that the design features the aluminum prominent <coughs> But presumably aluminum can be treated to prevent mold, pitting and erosion resulting from a salty sea environment. Otherwise, an alternative choice should be considered, lest, given time, the overall effect resembles running down the docks. Instead of retaining the desirable unique character of this special area, ad hoc waterfront developments continue to disappoint, lessening the desirable image that may still be possible to achieve to some extent, even now. Hopefully, some pleasant characteristics of this area will be preserved. Plants growing in summer among grass rather than in containers, for example. Also, that shade umbrellas inserted on each of tables will be plain, devoid of commercials of any kind. Furthermore, please give due consideration to preserving the rest of West Song Bay as a bona fide park constituted under his own individual bylaw for future generations to enjoy. Thank you. Thanks, Your Worship. We have an item of unfinished business. It pertains to building bylaw amendment number eight. And there's a 
error in the bylaw that substantively uh, impacts the content of the bylaw, we ask that you amend it. Substitution of the word or for the word and. Settle that easily. It says, I'll move the train. Thank you, Second Place. Second. All in favor? All in favor. Next to worship, we have reports of committees. The first report is from the Community Development Standing Committee, meeting held August 25th. There are two items. Next report is from the Governance and Priorities Committee meeting held September 1st. There are six items. We can pull items one and four. And the Planning and Land Use Committee report from September 1st. There's one item. Thank you. Next, Your Worship, we have motions for public hearing to be held Thursday, September 22nd. Move the hearing. Next, we have question period.
Vice Council ask a question? No. Thank you and welcome. <laughs> Sir, you're fine no. and happy. Thank you. Extra worship, we have closed business. Motion to go in camera. Second, please. All in favor? I believe we're going in Campbell to get a Campbell. In camera to get legal advice at this time on a couple of legal matters before the city of Detroit. All those in favor? 